Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel Tour update. And as we continue to deliberate the latest developments regarding to the war in Gaza, as well as other areas of conflagration, it's always important to remember how it all started. On October 7th, the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas-plagued Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly, men, women, children, and infants. 133 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Let's now turn to our TV7 editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. It's good to have you back. Thank you. What can you tell us about the latest developments, particularly on the Gazan front as well, on the northern front at this point in time? So the war is uh, not officially over by any means, um, but uh, it is being conducted on a very low level. We keep hearing about uh, this brigade or this um, artillery group um, being in contact with Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists, hunting them down, uh, some firefights. But this is what is known in the Israeli military jargon as combat days or battle days. Sporadic days in which there are fights, firefights, or some um, initiatives, but not successive days in which war of maneuver is being uh, conducted. Can we define this as a strategic stop? It is probably um, more of a pause in order to regroup, redeploy, perhaps shift the center of gravity to the north. You mentioned the Lebanese border, the fight against Hezbollah. And also, because we are in the aftermath of the, now it is called Iron Shield, the operation uh, to deflect the Iranian and proxy attack on Israel, um, on the night between Saturday and Sunday uh, Israel time. And we may be in what one may call the pre taliation time or pre response We are before the response or the retaliation, which may take a long time. But as for now, it doesn't make sense for the Israeli defense forces to conduct major operations in Gaza when they might be called um, either to fight against the Iranians or if the Iranians uh, decide to unleash Hezbollah into Israeli territory, not only exchanging uh, blows across the border, then the Israeli army within the military, not only the Air Force, must be ready for it. So obviously, until the hostage issue is resolved and until Hamas is uh, to uh, Israel's um, uh, satisfactory um, decision, no longer in control or mostly in control of Gaza, the war will not be officially over. But it is now um, in a sort of a halt of a pause. Indeed. Well, uh, operationally speaking, of course, Division 162 is currently uh, conducting various uh, pinpoint attacks against Hamas, as you, you mentioned. You call it division, but it's the headquarters under which a brigade combat team operates. So it's, brigade, it's, of course. It's not, it's not really a division. Indeed. Well, let's turn uh, to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, formerly Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. It's good to see you, General. I'd like to immediately ask you, uh, to your perspective on the latest with regard to the Gaza Strip, is this a strategic stop or a pause, as Mr. Owen just mentioned, or do you see this as a recalibration? to challenge or to withstand or face uh, greater threats emanating either from the north or from the east? Well, I think it's both. Uh, clearly, we would call it a tactical pause or an operational pause, sort of the fight between the fights uh, where you get a chance to resupply, uh, do a little bit of rest, uh, do a little bit of refit, bring in replacement soldiers, uh, so I don't necessarily think it's the end. 
uh, but it certainly is a type of pause. And as you say, it could be both for on the ground tactical reasons and as a uh, uh, element of caution uh, in case there, those forces are needed for an external threat coming in. And when we're looking particularly on the northern front, uh, we see uh, the Israeli Air Force, of course, conducting various uh, airstrikes against Hezbollah positions, uh, from which, of course, uh, a couple of days ago we saw a number of projectiles being fired. Today we saw a number of penetrations also of suicide drones entering into Israeli airspace. Uh, repeated attacks uh, or attempted attacks by Hezbollah to exert damage. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we're also waiting to see how this evolves into other theaters. No, I think that's right. And I think the major worry back here in Washington, D.C. is really twofold. It's not only the uh, potential response of Israel in the air or whatever tactics are used against uh, Iran for the Saturday night their Saturday night operation, but uh, also what happens after that? Are we going to go? Are we going to see an escalatory cycle in the region? Uh, will that drag Hezbollah in? Yes, there have been a uh, pretty tough depletion of the long-range missile stock uh, of Iran, but uh, there is no shortage of missiles uh, in Lebanon right now. So I think, at least from the perspective of Washington, it's a pretty tense time. I don't know how you all feel on the ground about this. Well, uh, tension is in the air, so it seems at least, uh, Mr. Owen. Well, uh, as you uh, recall, uh, being not only the uh, anchorman and expert here, but also a parent, there was a bit of confusion here the other night, because at 9 p.m. Uh, Israel time, the war cabinet convened, and at that time, the uh, home front command announced that there is no change in the restrictions announced uh, earlier. And that is schools and kindergartens and universities will be closed the next day, Monday. Lo and behold, three hours later at midnight, after the cabinet session ended, and apparently without a decision to retaliate against Iran, and therefore the very uh, possibility, the risk, that there will be a counter-retaliation, and therefore pupils could not go to school, the home front changed its instructions and said, fine, tomorrow morning all schools can be open. Many parents did not hear of it until the next morning, and uh, it was uh, quite confusing. So the word Tension does apply because there is a lot of talk by politicians and military officers that, yes, eventually we will choose the time, the place, the method to retaliate. But we won't tell you, now they are not using the term telegraph anymore, but we will not telegraph our intentions so that the other side will not uh, know of them. So the tension abated. Uh, to uh, quite an extent. But, you know, in Israel, at the flip of a switch, it can come back. In Arabic, they say, um, asal, um, basal. But, uh, General uh, Kim, I'd, I'd like to ask you, to what degree is currently the standoff between Iran and Israel within context of escalation dominance, so to speak? Well, it's certainly the case that <laughs> Israel is prepared to do a counter-response, as Amir said. Uh, but uh, aside from watching, the interpretation in Washington, D.C. is that the Iranians consider this one and done. Uh, at 5 o'clock Washington, D.C. time, I believe that's 12, 2400 uh, Tel Aviv time, the U.N. ambassador for, from Iran um, said, look, we've shot our load. Uh, this is it. We consider the matter concluded. So uh, the view from this end is that the Iranians had a one and done. They expect that to have settled uh, the price of the attack on, quote, Iranian sovereign territory inside the uh, Syrian embassy, unquote. But uh, it also appears that uh, that is not enough for Israel because Israel was invaded on their own home turf, something that's never been done 
by the Iranians since the 45 Islamic Revolution. Indeed. Well, uh, it is convenient for Iran to say it's a one and done, Mr. Oren. Now, of course, this tit and tat has been going on between the two countries for a very long time, far beyond uh, the 8th of October when the Iranian proxy Hezbollah in Lebanon launched an unprovoked attack on Israel from uh, multiple locations. This has yet to escalate into an all-out war, but uh, it was quite evident that uh, distinct from the other Iranian proxies throughout the region, Hezbollah launched 50 projectiles on that same night before, or the same day before, uh, the Iranians launched their first barrage, and therefore it seems like they try to compartmentalize their own actions to those of Iran and its other proxies. Was this done deliberately in your perspective? Well, maybe uh, it was an homage to the um, American uh, national hymn, uh, by the dawn's early light, the rocket's red glare. It wasn't uh, more than um, um, a show. Uh, they didn't expect it uh, to cause any damage. In fact, uh, last night, the uh, Israeli military announced that uh, half a dozen of its, uh, one of its uh, best recon units, uh, Sayyid Golani um, fighters, were wounded in an explosion inside Lebanese territory. They were on a mission, um, either surveillance or some other mission, outside of uh, Israel's territory and inside Lebanon. These are the very first Israeli soldiers to be wounded outside of uh, the Galilee, outside of the north uh, of Israel, uh, rather than um, the Lebanese, the Hezbollah rockets, are now not causing uh, any casualties, have not. But let me make some comments. First of all, Israel has uh, blatantly acted inside Iranian territory and bragged about it. That's the problem. As long as it was in the shadows, nobody really cared. This was part of uh, the deadly game. But when the uh, atomic archive was taken out of the Iranian capital and Mossad, plus Netanyahu uh, bragged about it. And when the Iranian nuclear scientist Fakhradzeh was assassinated, which probably he had it coming, but not in such a public way, that uh, then Mossad chief Yossi Cohen boasted about it, about the uh, clever methods uh, used in order to, to find him and then uh, attack his vehicle and so on and so forth. In addition to that, this was not the first time Iran attacked Israel's territory, but of course uh, not uh, um, in such a wholesale uh, way, but retail. There were drones carrying uh, munitions and explosives. Pre-October 7th. Yes, of course, launched from Syrian territory, either to bring them to the West Bank for Palestinian terrorists or in order to hit Israel and uh, one should also uh, add that uh, Chief of Staff Herzi Alevi, yesterday when he visited Nevatim Air Base, one of the bases, uh, by the way, which the U.S. Corps of Engineers built for the Israeli Air Force in return for Israel withdrawing from the air bases it built in the Sinai during the um, peace um, agreement with Egypt, Halevi said that when uh, an enemy a party uh, launches uh, missiles at Israel, Israel must respond. This is a new doctrine because the Houthis have been launching missiles, not successfully, but they have been launching missiles for almost six months now at Israel, and Israel doesn't have such a doctrine. So it seems that it is very emotional. This is not rational decision-making or even uh, being spoken in order to gain some deterrence. There is some deterrence achieved by the defensive, the excellent defensive action of Israel, the United States, Britain. Halevi called uh, British Chief of Defense, Admiral Tony Redkin, to um, congratulate him and to thank him. A day after he called the uh, CENTCOM commander, uh, General Kurila. And the Iranians also uh, achieved some sort of deterrence over Israel, because one does not expect Israel to repeat this sort of assassination 
um, in Damascus or elsewhere uh, anytime soon. Even if there is a target of opportunity, let's wait and see. But uh, it doesn't seem likely because Israeli decision makers, as well as the intelligence agencies, did not predict that this is going to be the Iranian response. Well, analysts, at least uh, the ones that I know, were surprised by the scale of the Iranian attack rather than the attack itself. But I'm going to push back on a couple of points that you noted. Uh, of course, it's one school of thought uh, with regard to Hezbollah, naturally. The, the right one, but go ahead. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you, you we'll may we'll have, have our differences on policy. Yes, of course. No, when I'm, we're talking I'm just, about I'm just Hezbollah, kidding, yeah? 246 Marines have been brutally murdered by this terrorist organization designated as such by uh, the State Department, by most of uh, the international community of this state, something that needs to be kept in mind, including the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, which is a designated foreign terrorist organization. Uh, when we're talking about Israeli boastfulness, I agree. Uh, certain things, even though it's counterproductive to our own work, trying to provide clear information about the situation in all theaters, uh, there are certain things that should remain in the shadows. And uh, when we're talking about Halevi's statement with regard to uh, rockets and missiles uh, demanding a response, uh, of course, particularly with regard to the Islamic Republic of Iran, I think that it's uh, conflicting at least your statement conflicts with uh, the fact that Israel may have struck Ansar Allah, namely the Houthi-dominated uh, terrorist organization in Yemen, uh, but kept Unan quiet. Unannounced. So, of course, if you wanted to not be boastful about things, we mm -hmm. cannot uh, provide analysis based on speculation sure. in this specific uh, instance in time. Uh, but with that being said, let's talk about two other elements that are important to Highlight, General uh, Kemet, I'd like to ask you, since the Iranians have also on Saturday, this uh, over the weekend, uh, commandeered one commercial vessel in uh, the Strait of Hormuz, while uh, Ansar Allah, the Houthi-dominated terrorist organization, continues to launch unprovoked uh, missiles and rockets towards uh, naval vessels, both commercial and American vessels, European vessels for that matter, what needs to be done in order to maintain freedom of navigation in such a volatile period? Well, two things. First of all, I think, to answer your question directly, I think we just need to keep at it. Uh, it is not yet time to put boots on the ground. Uh, it is not yet time to um, do an all-out attack on Houthi positions uh, other than their missile sites. It may be the time that we have to start bolstering the legitimate Sudanese uh, uh, Houthi, uh, excuse me, Yemeni forces in a special forces type advisory role, uh, provide them the assistance that they need to go after these guys the way we did with the Iranians against uh, the uh, ISIS inside of Iraq. Uh, we did with the Iraqis inside of Iraq against ISIS. Uh, but, but I want to go back to that earlier point. Uh, I, I think it's important to pick up on uh, Emir's point about the fact that Israel started announcing their operations and uh, many would say started boasting about their operations. There was a quid pro quo war going on in the shadows for years and years. There would be an a unannounced strike on Iranians. The Iranians would use their proxies to go against Western interests. But it almost seems we've gone not simply from a, a situation where you're lobbing bombs back and forth, but it's almost become performative. Uh, the fact that you're boasting about these operations in public, uh, in many ways, back the Iranians into a corner that they had to respond because you were sticking your thumb in their eye. They too came back with a performative uh, operation on Saturday night, uh, which proved two things. Number one, that uh, uh, they were capable of sending a large amount of uh, ordnance towards Israel. But number two, that that ordnance was not very good stuff. You had the cruise missiles and the ballistic missiles falling out of the sky just because they didn't work. Uh, the drones were easily knocked down. And that too was somewhat performative because at five o'clock in the afternoon in DC time, uh, 12 o'clock your time, the UN 
the Iranian ambassador in the UN said, halas, this is over. Um, uh, I, I think that if there is any group that has been acting uh, carefully and rationally on all this, it's been two groups. Uh, it's been Hassan Nasrallah, who's been very calculated in his uh, response to October 7th. And, and candidly, it's the Ayatollah who was very careful and strategic in its response to the killing of the Israeli, uh, excuse me, of the uh, Iranian generals uh, inside of Damascus. And this notion that uh, there must be a response, uh, maybe emotionally, uh, th that may be the emotional response on the part of the Israeli military. I'm not sure it doesn't lead to, as Amir said, that response, counter-response, response, counter-response, counter escalatory cycle. That's going to make the situation far worse. Look, the United States is dedicated to the defense of Israel. <clears throat> they proved that on Saturday night. We are not dedicated, we're not obligated to assist uh, Israel in offensive operations outside of Israel. So I think there ought to be some careful consideration on the next steps inside the Israeli war cabinet, because right now it is not coming across as rational and well thought out. You know, it's we'll have to agree to disagree, as uh, we already talked prior. But uh, sure. I think that strategically, when we're looking at the different activities that the Iranians have conducted over the course of many years and have done so prudently, I, I give them credit for that, for strategically activating various proxies, uh, the doctrine implemented by Qasem Soleimani, and then subsequently also evolving into various methods and maintaining a certain uh, policy of ambiguity as to its own role, which uh, obviously everybody who has a little bit sense of intelligence understands that the Iranians are behind everything conducted in the region. Uh, it is, of course, a point in time when we, we should consider that the Iranians are outmaneuvering the United States in the region and doing so with the blessing and support of both China and the Russian Republic, uh, something that obviously is counterproductive to U.S. interests on the global scale. General? Well, well, my point would simply be that this is not about American interests. It's about the protection of Israel. And candidly, the Israeli military and the Israeli government has used their number one proxy element uh, to fight the Iranians. That's the United States military and the United States Air Force. Uh, once, I think, in many ways, this has gone from a proxy war between uh, the U.S. and uh, the Iranian proxies and gone into direct attack between Israel and Iran. Uh, that's taken that, this to a completely new level. Well, you know, um, it's uh, risk analysis and you have uh, to choose what looks to you as the least worst option. Obviously, there is a price to pay in what is happening now. The Iranians are not deterred. The Houthis are not deterred and so on and so forth. Of course, it's costly. But the other option of escalating when you don't really know what the end state is going to be, especially with the November elections coming, and you're going to get into what may be perceived or at least depicted as another forever war, this is not uh, a good option to. And um, it's interesting uh, to quote General Halevi, the Israeli chief of staff, when he said that a week ago on Monday, Israel understood that this attack is coming. And therefore, he, Halevi, called on General Kurila, the CENTCOM, chief, who showed up in Israel on Thursday, a couple of days later, and then they coordinated the defense. Now, when Defense Secretary Austin called Israeli Minister of Defense Gallant, he mentioned that the U.S. interest is the protection of U.S. personnel as well as Israel. So if Iran retaliates against American forces in the Middle East, the U.S. does not want to stand still for it, and therefore it uh, well behooves Israel to regard the American requests as binding. Well, uh, Israel does regard every demand or request by the United States very seriously. We don't have very much time left, but I'd like to 
return to something you said about the U.S. and CENTCOM being proxies to Israel. I'm confused there. I, I, I meant my words. I mean, uh, in many ways, the United States is in the Middle East for the protection of Israel and has been for many, many years. I'd like to go back to Amir's point about the Iranians uh, and deterrence. Uh, candidly, I think the failure and the weakness that was demonstrated on Saturday night by the equipment of the Iranians has caused them to take a deep breath and understand that, you know, they sent their longest range equipment and it didn't work and it was easily knocked out of the sky. Isn't that a, isn't that a sign of deterrence on the part of the Iranians or that they have been deterred? When you realize that you don't have the capability to uh, respond, uh, then you've got to take other actions and other behaviors. In many ways, I would say that's deterrence. Indeed. Well, uh, with regard to your first part, uh, I have to push back on that. But uh, we will Please leave do. the hows and whats uh, for another time. I, I don't think that uh, the United States in any way or form is in the region because of Israel rather because it's the Rome of the 21st century, and unless it maintains a fingerprint in every sector of the entire world, it will lose that position to its rivals, such as China and Russia. Uh, a second point uh, being is the fact that ultimately, when you really look on the deterrent capacity, uh, I do agree that uh, there is a factor of deterrence about Israel's capabilities which were displayed. Uh, this past weekend. Nevertheless, something that needs to be uh, amplified is deterrence does not work only from a defensive perspective. There needs to be a low signature to a medium signature attack that will hurt the Iranians strategically with a clear signal in between the lines to ensure that the Iranians will not repeat such a blatant attack on Israeli sovereignty or U.S. forces, for that matter, and something that I believe personally uh, is necessary. Of course, those are two schools of thoughts that are uh, in ongoing competition with one another, both in Washington and in Jerusalem, and we'll have to see how this uh, matter evolves. But unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Mr. Owen, of course, and General Kimmett for a very lively and interesting discussion, if I may add. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem, shalom. I'm Eran Etzion, former Deputy National Security Advisor here in Israel, a diplomat, a strategist by training. I'm very happy to be at TV7 and offer my interpretation along my esteemed colleagues. The uh, strong point of TV7 is to be a reliable source of authoritative insight in an era of shallow news environment that is very difficult for viewers to trust.